Good afternoon, everybody. Um, the picture in front of you is uh, Gotham Plowstots at Darnholm, circa 1956, crossing the, the river. Um, and it's one that we recreated some years ago with, with Doc Rowe. And I thought that it would be a nice opening shot amongst the many we have um, to sort of bring this in. Um, I have to say that I'm not an expert um, and I don't profess to be an expert. All I'm going to do is talk about both and Plowstots um, as I see them, as I understand them, and quite often as I live, eat and breathe them, as my good lady would tell you. Next one. Um, the Singing On song, which is on the left-hand side, is a song that I have sung quite often in various places, most notably on the stage of the uh, Royal Albert Hall um, at a concert way back when um, with the uh, Watson Carthys. Um, interestingly enough, I was looking up something yesterday or last night, um, and that actual tune or that those words predate, I am, to, I am given to understand, 1857. So, we'll, but we can come on to that um, as we move along. Yes, Sally. I think to understand Gotham and understand Gotham Plowstots, we, we sort of got to go to, um, go back to the earliest records we can find. And the earliest ones that we're certainly aware of and that I'm certainly aware of, and there may be others abound, um, come from 18, 1812. And it was in the, uh, the history of Whitby that by the Reverend George Young, he wrote this in 1812, as I said. Um, however, if anybody understands Gothland um, and has had a look into the uh, newspaper archives that are freely available, and also some of the manuscripts that I happen to have, um, there is obviously um, records of Gothland dancing, certainly in 1870, um, and records of where they were, how many people that there were, and, and um, how many people turned up at these various stills. It's interesting to note that um, some of these, if you know Gotham very well at all, and, and some of you do, I, I am aware, um, they used to use two particular places for their meetings, if you will, their wash-up meetings, their do's, and it fascinates me um, to try and work out how 200 people seemingly managed to get into the Lord Nelson at Beck Hall. The Lord Nelson at Beck Hall and the crossed pipes, which became the cross pipes uh, before it gave its license up, and that's how the Malian Spout Hotel was created. Um, they had similar numbers, and both of them were, if you will, social, social sites within the village. There was a, a couple of other pubs, um, there was the Hare and Hounds, which was Waits House next to the Gotham Hotel, but that didn't exist, of course. And that was what they call a jerry pub, presumed because they used to brew the beer in the pub itself and serve it from there. But they never met there. They used uh, the crossed pipes, or the crossed pipes, depends which way you want to call it, uh, and the uh, the Lord Nelson at Beck Hall. And there were quite, quite uh, lively events Um and they, they always, it was always followed the, the week's tour or the fortnight's tour that they used to embark on. Because quite often, distances covered were quite significant. Um, and of course, prior to sort of 1880-some, the railway didn't exist in Gothland. So wherever you went, you were liable, liable to go um, um, on foot. In fact, there is a record um, of Gothland uh, leaving uh, Gotham Village in 1870, uh, preceded by a guy called uh, Dowson, who Ralph Dowson, who was a self-styled king of the Plowstots. Um, and he uh, he was in front. They were led by the Lockton uh, Brass Band um, and in a company of 100 people, marched from Gotham to dance. Now... You know, that's if you know the if you know the, the the fact that the roads weren't particularly very good, and the fact that um, it's a fair old hike from Gotham to Whitby and back, um, 
And the band, of course, would have to come from Lockton, which is, again, across the moors, um, uh, before they actually set off to, 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 uh, to Whitby. So, they, you know, these were quite social events. And, of course, the, the people who danced, as I can understand and I make out, um, were all of the same. We, we, Gotham itself didn't have what you would call a ruling class. Everybody was um, of the same level, for want of a better word. Um, you were either a peasant or slightly above peasant, um, but nobody seemed to mind. The thing that was more interested in Gotham was um, the acquisition of land. The land seemed to be the thing that they wanted. And of course, Gotham uh, was, uh, was a place where land was freely available if you could clear it, which is, um, wh which is what happened. They set about clearing the land from the moor uh, and reclaiming it. It's not an uncommon phenomenon, actually, because during the Second World War, if you actually come to Gotham and look around, there are areas that were reclaimed from the moor in the dig for victory um, um, carry on or whatever you want to call it, farming methodologies. So Gotham itself was a, a fairly poor place, um, had no sanitation or any water, but it had lots of things going for it. And what, one of it was a lot of people who were very, very industrious. And of course, um, the railway or the railways was that came from Whitby originally, um, opened up the village to, uh, shall we say, moving things around. So slowly Gotham moved out, shall we say, from the dark ages, which inevitably they were, into the light ages. Of course, the sword team um, formed part of that. Uh, it's interesting to note uh, that in the late Trevor Stone uh, wrote a book, many of you will have a copy of it, I dare say, called Rattle Up Me Boys, um, and, and he credits um, the fact that uh, a chap from Gotham, a chap called Ventress, was the man who actually took longsword dancing to, um, to, to Loftus and, and the areas on the East Cleveland coast, which became synonymous with sword dancing until the early part of uh, 1990 when Loftus ceased to dance. Um, and I think we need to move on from there now, Sally. Thank you. Uh, we've got the tunes now, and I'll leave that one down to Steve. Yeah, all right. Well, I'll, well um, I've got to share the honours because um, I'm a twin brother. Uh, sorry, I'm a twin. I have a twin brother called Reg. And if you were talking about we, um, that's not the royal we. It's because there was both of us. And, uh, and if you're talking about our father, that's nothing to do with the church either. It's because <laughs> obviously we have the same father. And, um, <laughs> and we learnt the... Um, we learnt the tunes uh, from our father. Um, really, well, it would be when we before we went to Whitby, so before we were eleven. And um, I suspect there were two influences on my father who never played for the dancers. Um, one was a guy called Frank Humphrey or something. I never mean, got his second name. Um, my dad moved to the uh, Manor Farm, which was next to the church, in the early nineteen twenties. And um, there was a guy in um, the church cottages behind the church who played the mouth organ. My dad used to say that he could make the, the uh, mouth organ speak, and I think it was probably him who we learnt the tunes from. But another influence on my father is the guy in the left-hand corner of the screen, which is um, Bill Pennock. And um, uh, my dad knew Bill Pennock well. And in the early 60s, uh, it would just be in the last year or two before he died, um, I, could, I can remember seeing him. Bill Pennock used to come up to the farm on a night. We had a farm on Down the Road, where my brother is now. And uh, he would bring his fiddle because either his wife or his sister wouldn't let him play in the house. And so he used to bring the fiddle up and play with my dad uh, when my dad was milking the cows and things on a night. And we were being babysat in the cow shed while he milked. And um, my dad bought us uh, mouth organs. I've still got the mouth organs that he bought us. A little Hona band one, which I think would be before we went to Whitby School. And then an Echo, a double-sided one, um, when we went to... It must have been a year after we started at uh, Whitby School. And when we went to Whitby School, we started to play for Joe Brown. And um, uh, Joe Brown used to teach kids in the grammar school at Whitby and also lots of other schools. And uh, he taught us to dance uh, in the first year, I think. And we went to Darlington Festival and Whitby Festival, along with lots of other school kids. And I remember then seeing the uh, Loftus team and these uh, teams from Cleveland. There was a team from... Lawrence Jackson School and those kind of uh, uh, 
experiences influence you for the rest of your life in terms of the way they used to play the uh, the tunes and dance and things. I should say about um, Bill Pennock before I move on that um, Bill's obviously uh, well known because not only did he uh, used to uh, go and uh, play, play his fiddle to me dad when he was milking cows, but he was uh, well known because he used to go around doing uh, country dances. And uh, Jim Eldon, who's pictured there with his fiddle with us, and Mossy, uh, uh, Mossy who's listening. But Jim and Mossy have done a lot of research into um, uh, uh, Bill Pennock and um, Derek Schofield wrote an article about him as well. So there's a, a, a lot known. We'll move on to the, um, there's a number of plough stop dancers that we're going to show you a little video of as we go through just to punctuate Keith's lovely dulcet tone. So <laughs> this one is <laughs> dance number one. Okay. I think it's worth mentioning, um, although we put up here that 1921 to 1923 is the Reformation, um, I think it's quite wor worth mentioning the fact that the team stopped dancing in around 1885, and that was the last mention that was made of them. And there's been a lot of speculation as to why um, they stopped. Um, because I was doing involved with another project within the village that re related to war memorials, um, I met a lady called Pat Sellers, who um, is 80 some year old, and uh, in her formative life, she'd pulled together a thing called Village Life. And I'd never seen this document before, and I know that none of the, that, it, that no one else has ever has. And in it, she gives the clearest description or the reasons why um, the team seemed to ceased to dance. <coughs> they had a, 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 a team of what they call magi pegs, and it's quite well known. They were the ones who sort of went around and hustled people. They didn't do the collecting, they sort of annoyed people. And uh, they got to the point where there was that many people going out with the team dancing. It became extremely unruly, the whole lot of them the whole tribe, um, there was nobody in the village, apparently, who was willing to take it on. And that's why, in part, the village, they stopped dancing. And also, the, the thing I, I, I've been involved in writing a book on the village history, um, just recently, which I published. Um, and actually, when you read it, you suddenly discover that apart from the fact that they had this unruly mob that nobody could keep a grip of, um, the village was going through what they call a serious social change. And by that, I mean, the railway had come. It had opened the village up. There was several big houses, many big houses actually being built. And if you come to Gothland, you can see them. So the need to rely on money that was raised from going out um, dancing um, drifted back, back and back and back to the point where they effectively gave up. And it wasn't until Frank Dowson who moved back to the village. And Dowson is an extremely interesting man. Um, and again, everybody thinks they know everything. And I thought I knew everything, but I didn't. Um, I was uh, in, in the cause of writing this book that I've just, that was recently published. 
I happened to have a conversation with somebody who lives at New Wath, which is where Dowson came back to. He was born there and he moved back there in 1921 with his first wife, who he met when he moved to London. He was a school teacher, Dowson. And in 1896, he was a pupil teacher. He started up teaching in Gotham Primary School. That's where he actually first taught. And he comes from an old Gotham family, along with the Slight Homes. That Slight Home with an M and Slight Home with an E at the end. There's two families of Slight Homes. And there are certain families that run through Gotham, a bit like blood courses through veins. Anyway, he came back to the village and he'd obviously um, had an interest because of presumably he taught English um, in, in the arts and he counted Sharp as one of his friends and sort of he decided, uh, in, he was actually inspired, I think are the words, um, by Sharp's visit to the area that he knew of, that he, he resolved he was going to reform the Plowstots or attempt to reform the Plowstots. And it always puzzled me, given the relative simplicity of the dances, why it took him from 1921 to 1923. I couldn't quite get my head around that one um, because I was always told that he was a retired schoolmaster. Well, he was in 1933, but when he came back from uh, when he came back to uh, New Wath in 1921, because his first wife was uh, only poorly and country air was deemed to be something that would make you better, um, he was actually still teaching in in London, um, because of course in those days you could get on a train in Gotham uh, twice a day and go to London. In fact, you could go anywhere. From Gotham, you didn't act, you didn't need a car. Uh, all you had to do was wander down to the station with a timetable, um, jump on a train, and there you were. So quite a lot of his life was spent um, living in in London uh, as opposed to living at New Wath, um, and so that would take time. And of course, the building boom was on, and Gotham was, um, if you will. It had got a nine. It got a nine-hole golf course that had been put through the village. Uh, the Malian Spout Hotel had opened up. Um, in winter, as we have now, uh, they even um, dug a, a, an ice skating pond on the tarn, as it's called. They created a place that would freeze where they go go ice skating. So it was quite a wealthy place. In fact, it was a very wealthy place. There was at least four major ship owners that were domiciled, lived in in Gotham. So money was plentiful. Um, but he dis he resolved he was going to try and resolve and restart the plow starts. So he called a village meeting, and then it's documented that the villagers uh, was well attended, and uh, he called the meeting in 1921, and the people attended and they brought forth their artifacts. One or two of them we still have. Um, so he took from 1921 to 1923 to get the team back up uh, and running. Um, and it was in January 1923, following the blessing of the plough ceremony, which coincidentally would have been today or should have been today. It was our plough blessing ceremony um, at St. Mary's at 10 o'clock. Um, but unfortunately, COVID-19 has knocked the, nail, knocked the nail into that one. Um, so 1923, after the blessing of the plough ceremony, out went the team. Sally? Jim? There we go then. I don't know if you can hear me because it's uh, yes. everything being a bit strange. But what I'm going to do then is I'm going to sing the little greeting song that I brought. Oh, nothing, because I'm an East Riding chap rather than a North Riding chap. But Steve Pearson <coughs> invite in, uh, somebody to set up, but I don't know if I'm telling you can't hear me. Anyway, this is the little song Steve asked me to sing for you. <laughs> I am a merry plough boy, I come but once a year to wish you all a merry Christmas and a happy new year. The merry bells are ringing, the old year's past. We're hoping that this next year will be better than the last. Bring out your bows and glasses and give hearty cheer as I wish you a merry Christmas and a happy new year. Thank you, Jim. So I, I, I've mentioned I mentioned briefly what it be called the big village meeting, which was held in the in the parish room, um, and that was the precursor to uh, getting the team uh, going again. Um, 
And with that, off they went off on their first uh, plough tour in uh, 1923. Um, Sorry, do you want to play dance number two? worth spending a little bit more time on Dowson himself, um, who was a very interesting chap. And one of the things that we are blessed with in Gothland um, is the amount of information that is available and was available. Um, and Dowson himself wrote a book, um, and it's called Gothland in its its history and what's it called? Gothland in History and Folklore, uh, which he published in 1947. Um, there was only a hundred of these printed and fortuitously, having tried for many years, uh, I bought one off the internet, uh, I think it was about £80, pounds, and a friend of mine found one in on Skip Market for 50 pence. Um, there is a model to the story, but I'm not quite sure what, what that is. Um, and, and Dowson spent a lot of time uh, and within contained within that book, in fact, I was looking at it again today, is information that... Um, is, is there for you to read, digest and look, which I've been doing again today. <coughs> Quite often people buy books or get books like this and don't actually read. They read the bit they're interested in about the plow stores, but they don't actually read some of the other things that are in there, which probably helps to explain the things that under, underpin the team or underpins the team within its place within, within the village. And the fact that um, I was reminded he, he was a, a great writer uh, was Dowson, uh, and in fact, um, he's credited um, with helping to form the Yorkshire Dialect Society. <laughs> and in, uh, I'm at the moment writing the history of the Gotham Plowstots, um, and I wanted some information and found it difficult to get. And I'm indebted to Professor Widdison, John Widdison, uh, who is the architect of, uh, sorry, the archivist, <laughs> architect, the archivist of the Yorkshire Dialect Society, who I uh, had good reason to talk with, and he very kindly sent me some information, um, which I've been able to use and verify and whatever. Um, documents I couldn't get, documents I didn't have, documents I knew that existed. But the thing that he impressed on me most was the fact that writing things down is important. Um, People can read it later, as I've been doing again today and yesterday, and you can read it in 50 years' time. You can challenge the written word if you then can go and find something else to challenge it with. But if you've got nothing written down, then the only history that you've got is that that's given by, spoken by mouth. I'm not saying that it's wrong. The Aborigines have their culture, and they use a lot of this to maintain their traditions. But it is important, and he stressed on me, and I think I think it's quite right. And being able to to go, if you will, to things something that Trevor Stone wrote uh, back in 18, 8, 1980, and something that Dowson wrote in nineteen forty seven, or something that uh, um, 
Pat Sears wrote in what, 1950 something through to 1964. It's very important to be able to look in documents like that to get the information that you want. So Dowson is a key player in everything that we do. And there's absolutely no doubt without him, there would be no tradition. You can, you can cut it, dice it and slice it, whichever way you want to call it. But he gave to us the fortunate tradition that we are, if you will, I always count as custodians of a tradition. Um, we don't own it. We just look after it. We sometimes change bits on the, on the edge, edge of it. And then we pass it on, hopefully, to another generation who will look after it, will mould it, will alter it, whatever you want to call it, and pass it on to another generation, which has successfully happened um, in Gotham for, for, for a number of years. So once we got the team up and running back in 23 and going out and about, um, I, um, the, it, it went out pretty well every year <coughs> until 1939. And if anyone wants to proof of that, if you go to Pathia News and we weren't going to pay their exorbitant costs uh, for playing a clip of, I think it was about 30 seconds in black and white of Gotham dancing up by the uh, War Memorial, which incidentally, um, is is, is modelled on Raph's uh, um, Lilla Cross at the backside of uh, Filingdale's Moor. Um, so the, our war memorial has, if you will, a, a, a twin sister that it uh, mo uh, that is modelled upon. Um, if you uh, when you go out and about, they went out um, for a fortnight. Um, the distances travel, and these are well noted and they're well documented. So this isn't sort of Keith Thompson saying, well, they went here, they went there. What I do know is that in 1925, for instance, they set off and they went off for a fortnight. Um, and they went as far as Kirby Moore's side and then on to Helmsley. And these are some distances to travel. Um, they, they obviously they targeted Malton quite regularly. Malton was obviously a, a major agricultural uh, centre a cattle market and he targeted Morton. He targeted places where, for want of a better word, they knew full well that they, <coughs> excuse me, that they were going to get a good bag, which was very important. Um, but they only went out, when they came back, they only, if they went out for a week, the money that they then collected on the Saturday, they always ended up in Whitby, coincidentally, on a Saturday. Um, and again, that's well documented, the arguments that Gotham Plowstots and other Plowstot teams had uh, on the dock end um, when they met up with each other because they're all fighting for the same uh, pennies, if you will. And I'm, I'm reminded or minded uh, of a conversation I, I had with probably one of the last people who went on a plow tour. He was a guy called uh, Alwyn Grayson or Alwyn Boy Grayson. I mean, he went by the name of Boy. Everybody called him Boy. And I think at the time he was 70 odd year old and it was a bit odd for me calling him boy, but that was the name he answered to. And we were talking about the plow, plow tour and where they went. Um, and to understand that most of it was on foot. And they, <coughs> excuse me, they had places where farmers expected them to be. They were expected to be there. It wasn't a case of, would you like to come here? Some of the outlying farms, most of them expected them to pass through. There was a big thing um, in Gotham and surrounding that tradition was all important. Um, so they were well supported. And this and I said, well, where did you sleep? Oh, well, near his barn. We'd stop off wherever and we'd sleep in a barn. And then we'd get a bit of bit to eat the next morning. And then unless you didn't take your piece with you, okay. Um, and then they would set off again on, on walking all over. Um, and he was telling me one day that they set off from Gotham and literally walked out of Gotham and walked to Slights and danced and then gone from Slights and had uh, made the way over to Robin Hood's Bay. And then from Robin Hood's Bay, they'd gone to uh, the Flask uh, at Filingdale. So if anybody knows um, that distance and fancies walking it and then dancing as you go um, in January, um, you are extremely welcome to give it a crack um, because it's a long way and there's a, a lot of ups and there's a lot of downs because obviously 
they're living in growth and you either go up to come down or down to come up. It doesn't really matter. But one way or the other, you're going up and down. And they travelled significant distances. What they did, uh, because obviously their National Health Service didn't exist. There was no such thing. Um, and in fact, uh, in 1909, 1909, no, 1906, I beg your pardon, um, Gotham formed its own mutual aid or health uh, cooperative, if you will, where you paid so much in, and then if you were incapacitated or needed hospitalisation, um, you got a voucher to take to the hospital. The NHS didn't exist. And I always wondered, and we always wondered, what happened, why they always went to Whitby on the Saturday, um, and what happened to the money, and... We assumed it went into the general pot, but it didn't. The money that was collected on the Saturday after the plough tour um, was ring-fenced, for want of a better word, and it was used to buy uh, uh, medical vouchers or medical care for the local doctor or the midwife. Um, and these were in the forms of uh, I, uh, tickets, I understand. And I never understood, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know that. Um, what happened, um, because again, it's always been a mystery to me uh, why, why they ring-fenced the money on the Saturday. Um, I met a lady, I was introduced to a lady, um, and her brother was the second husband of Dowson's uh, second wife. Dowson's first wife died in 1937. And he married uh, a lady called uh, Ellen Bracegirdle in 1939. Uh, again, something else I only found out in the relevant recent past. Um, and she was from Bolton. Um, the thing I would, uh, as an aside, it seemed that Gotham men, when your first wife died, they went and found another one quite rapidly. Um, obviously, uh, obviously, having a female companion was uh, considered de rigueur uh, in those days. Um, they didn't hang around. And there is one case where he buried his wife in the April and he married again in the August. A bit, bit quick, but there we go. Um, so the money that they got bought medical care. Um, and they had a health care unit, or union, if you will, that was formed. And again, these are only documents that, are, that have become available or are found. And it helps to explain that Plaustot's place within within the villages as, as, as we would know its, its place um, and why so many people held it, held it in such awe. I, I was asking her uh, in researching this book I'm on with, on the, about the plow starts, um, there is a guy who's alive, uh, George, George Grayson. Uh, he's 90. Uh, he's the oldest surviving plow start that I am aware of. Uh, in fact, he, that, I, yeah, that I am aware of, that danced. Um, and I was talking to him uh, about July, August last year. I went to see him for see if he had any old photographs. And I was just saying, to George, oh, what, what made you start dancing? And he, he looked at me rather quizzically and he said, well, that's what a lad in Gothland did. And you thought, huh, well, there you go. Um, it was part and parcel, if you will of what people in Gotham uh, <coughs> did for a hobby. Because in those days as well, people need to remember, um, although Gotham had opened up and become a, a tourist village, which it was, uh, very much so, it wasn't until probably 1994 five when we had got that TV series that came to our village and stayed 20 years, um, that the village became... a uh, 52 week of the year visitor centre. Um, up until then, sort of from, if you will, half term in October until Good Friday, Gotham closed down um, and all the village activities started. I was very fortunate um, to be here when these activities, when this, we call it village time. Um, and it was nice to be part of a community that came together. It did its work. And then it was their time to come out and play, which probably explains why the Plowstots, if you will, were so well supported. And I do know they were well, they were well supported. I, I'm, I'm quite minded. Um, I remember particularly the older people, and of which sadly there's only one that is alive now. Uh, and she doesn't live in the village anymore. Uh, 
<coughs> but uh, there are not many people left. But I am minded uh, going out on our day of dance in January um, and pinned to somebody's door <laughs> um, was an envelope left behind um, with some money for the plow stots. The lady in question, um, she'd gone to Australia to visit her daughter, but such was her feeling, if you will, her need, whatever you want to call it, that she'd given a neighbour an envelope for golf and plough stocks with instructions to pin to her front door on a specific day in January. And she knew that we would come around and that she, if you will, felt it her duty or she felt it was part of the tradition to put some money in. She could have gone to Australia and we would never have known, uh, ever have known. Why would you know? Um, but no, uh, the lady actually was a lady called Elsie Goldsborough. And I've always remembered that. And then there was other people like Frida Pennock who, who considered her year um, in conversation with her didn't start until the plow stops had passed by. But obviously these are times when, if you will, pre, if you will, 1993-94. But, but the era between, if you will, 90, 1923 to 1947, the team was extremely active locally. Um, that I, I, again, I, I've been very fortunate. I've just had some more photographs sent to me relatively recently of um, pictures of the team dancing in uh, 1935, I think it was, and then again in 1936 at the Jubilee and at the King's Coronation. Again, photographs, I didn't know that, that they, they existed. Um, that have been that have been given for our archive, but um, and one of them actually uh, is at the top of the screen. If it's on the screen now, um, that's the um, uh, the picture. That one there, that was taken uh, by again uh, by a lady who uh, knew what we were doing and and, and sent it to us. I think importantly as well, Dawson, um, who was the key driver in this, um, when we got to 1939, obviously. The war intervened, but um, Dawson uh, continued, if you will, um, what he called some of his finest hours. Or when he went was when he went to uh, broadcast on the BBC, in, as he did in uh, I think it was nineteen as the, the back script there. I think it's nineteen forty four. Um, he went and gave a talk to to BBC. Um, how you saw it danced on a radio? I'm not quite sure, but he went to uh, Leeds. Um, and counts that, and another one he did in the 1930, about 1937, as his finest hours uh, with the team. He was actually, uh, in his book, again, I've just been reading this morning, there's a chap called, uh, when he when he reformed the team, uh, he got significant help from a number of people. There was two men particularly, one who were both called John, or they're both called Slido, They'd both been landlords of the cross pipes, but one had an E and one didn't. But he also had a sidekick uh, called Major uh, Fairfax Blake, who lived at Westerdale Hall. Um, and he went by the name, I think, of Newsboy. He was a racing tipster, amongst other things, in the Northern Echo or the Evening Gazette on Teesside, from memory. Um, and uh, he he helped them. But I was just in, in the forward to Dalton's book, um, Fairfax Blaker notes that he was a man who was extremely reticent to claim any limelight, the limelight that others were claiming. Um, he didn't claim, he didn't think, um, he didn't want to appear, if you will, to be big headed, for want of a better word. He, he, he just, it was, he, I, I guess he figured it was his duty um, to note it down. And of course, having been village born and village bred from a longevity of British people, you know, there's no wonder he could put the team together. Okay, so if we want to move on to uh, 1970, if you will, and then, uh, so we, we sort of, when the team came back in 19, uh, after, we didn't start dancing again until 1947, that much I do know, um, because the lady who told me how, what they did with the money, she was the person who washed the kit. They'd been kept in, in Dowson's house at New Wath in a wicker basket in his loft. So we know that they actually didn't go out till 1947. The reason for that is very simple. Two men from the village were prisoners of war in, in the Far East and Gotham never celebrated VE Day 
he'd only ever celebrated VJ Day, which meant that the next time that they could go out to dance was in, was in 1947. And that's when they set off again. And again, they were quite successful. They went here, there and everywhere. I'm, I'm minded by the words of uh, George Grayson, the ninth the nonagenarian, when I said, well, where did you go? And he, he looked at me a bit nonplussed. No, we went here and we went there. I said, well, how did you get there? Well, I went on the bus. Aye, we went to Darlington. Yeah, we used to go on Darlington to dance. Aye, we won the cup, you know. Bye, we did get drunk. <laughs> thought, well, nothing changed there then, George. Um, but they, they they used to go all over the place. Um, uh, and the team sort of seemed to go from strength to strength. Uh, and then we got we we moved into, if you will, we had a bit of a, 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 a lull, I think. I think the team comes, a, it's a bit like watching a, a, a tide roll in and roll out again. You know, you get great big waves that wash right up and then all of a sudden it starts to ebb back a little bit. And then you get another a refreshment and you get waves come back on the, or, or, or back onto the beach again or onto the shore. <coughs> so, you know, all teams ebb and flow. Um, and Gotham, certainly towards the end of the late 60s, was ebbing a little bit, I know that much. And then we got, if you will, another refreshment, if you will. There was, they were still going out dancing. I mean, don't get me wrong. Um, probably not as much as the, the vigour that they threw into <coughs> the 1970s uh, and the early part of the 80s, where, um, and, and it, it's sort of a bit of a black hole for golf, for me. Um, there was certainly, a, if you will, around about 1973, 74, there was a, what you might call in a nice sign warfare broke, broke loose in Gothland. Um, um, and, it's, and it is documented. I mean, and it's no good trying to hide it because, if you try and hide it, people say, well, why didn't you talk about that? You know, you're dirty washing sometimes. I don't call it dirty washing. It's what happens. Um, the, the chap that led the train uh, for a lot of years through the 50s and, and the 60s was a one chap called uh, Jack Scarf. And, and to his credit, he is, the, he is the glue that carried it through the 50s and the 60s. But as is everything else, uh, you get the, the new generation come out. And, and if you will... They started feeling the feet, for want of a better word, um, and uh, they decided that what they would want to do wasn't necessarily what uh, Jack wanted to do. Jack didn't particularly like drinking. Drinking was not high on his agenda, whereas the the new breed, if you will, quite liked the drink, uh, quite quite liked to uh, uh, go out dancing. And and and, uh, and I said to one of them, "Well, you know, where did you go?" Because I can't find anything. Oh, we went to London two or three times. We danced at the Albert Hall, and there's no documents. There's absolutely nothing anywhere. Uh, we went up to Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Folk Festival, the first one of theirs, and and slowly and surely, bits and pieces have uh, come out. But um, what happened in Gorton? Jack Scarf decided that the way the team was going to a degree, he didn't like it. So he had a meeting with some guys from Green Ginger, and he taught Gorton their dance. Um, and that was, if you will, um, he always said, it was said that Gotham weren't dancing. Uh, Mick Atkinson, and many of you who are listening to this will know Michael Atkinson. Michael Atkinson isn't a man, and well, he wasn't a man, shall I say. He was a very good friend of mine. In fact, a friend of a lot of people on were probably tuned into this. He was probably the nicest man I've ever met in my life. He was a gentle gentleman, and he was a hill farmer. It, but this irked him, and it irked him all his life. It irked him to the point where um, there was an article appeared in in, in Rattle Up Me Boys um, about Green Ginger rescuing um, the Gotham Dance. And I was summary, I was secretary, I think, of the team, and I was summoned by Margaret one Sunday afternoon, um, which was very odd. Uh, Michael was on his tractor. Now, he didn't ordinarily work on a Sunday, Sunday was his day off ordinarily, as most people would know. Uh, he slipped the leash at 10 o'clock and disappeared um, to the pub. Um, and he was sitting on his tractor in the middle of the field at Gotham House Farm. And I had to sort of walk around the back of the farmhouse and then up the field. And Michael was uh, rowing hay and he shot off his uh, tractor. And to say he was upset uh, was an understatement. Although it was never spoken, friendships that had been real firm friendships uh, were cast asunder that day. 
Um, and it were, and it, it was never said to the person who, who, who authored the article, who again is also passed over. Um, but it was it was a sad time. And Aki said, you know, we just didn't stop dancing. What it was, we wanted to do what we wanted to do, and he didn't quite like it. So he spit his spit his hog out um, and and we, and went his own way. Um, I think what really irritated them as well, as I understand it, uh, Green Ginger danced golf in, in front of the Queen somewhere, some do, and that really that I think <laughs> I think I think that was a, that was another nail in the coffin, shall we say, um, or another one of the reasons why he was, uh, shall we say, somewhat upset. But it, it, they were out and about, and they were all over the place. They um, they they did as they would want to do, um, uh, which is interesting. Um, and that's where, and that's sort of where we were up to sort of 1982, Sally. say 1982 if you will um, and again um, the thing I do remember uh, in the village um, those sort of times in the village where uh, if you will you feared for the team for want of a better word um, um, and often wondered whether I, I, I moved to the village in the early about 1980 81 there or thereabouts um, and uh, I had a passing interest in folk music. Um, um, I know people always boast about who they're pals with, but I actually grew up on a council estate in Normanby, um, and it's not boasting, it's a fact of life. Uh, pal of mine was Vin Garbard, uh, uh, now sadly again, sadly no longer with us. And of course in 19, there was a folk revival sometime middle of the 1960s, if you will. The first thing I can ever remember was going and seeing uh, I think it was Martin Carthy and Dave Swarbrick in a big marquee at ICI in 1967, I think, at the Teesside International High Stedford. And I suppose I spiked my interest in, in all things folk. So when I came to the village my, with my two daughters, we moved here. Uh, my mother and father lived in the next valley over. They lived on Eskdale side between Gromont and, and, and Slides. They lived there. But we came back from Aberdeen uh, and... Uh, we came to live in Gothland and uh, you joined the social circle. As I said, the village life came to life in around, uh, in the October. Uh, I think we, well, I know we landed here in, in, the, in the December. I have to say, uh, I've never been, I mean, I, I've been offshore and I've been in the Arctic Circle, but I'd never been as cold as I was when we moved into that house. I mean, it was Baltic. Um, anyway, we, we got over that. You soon learn your lessons in Gothland. Um, two pair of wellies and as many jumpers as you can get. Um, and uh, village life, if you will, uh, hung or swiveled around pubs and drinking. Um, I like and living in Gotham in the 80s and the 90s um, as probably the best village time that I can remember. It may well have been better before then, I have no idea. But it was certainly a happy, happy place to be. There were happy times. Um, and uh, I don't quite know how I uh, got involved. Um, 
but I sort of got asked along to a, a couple of practices and, and we used to have the place called Reading Room in the village and I got asked along to a couple of practices and I think I went to two, I think, and they said, oh, we're going off for a dance. We're going to Pickering somewhere. All oh, right, okay. Why don't you come and hold the banner? Oh, that was a good idea. So I would go and I'll do all the banner. That's not a bad thing to do. Uh, break, break me in gently. Um, got there, only to discover that uh, there was five a musician and I made six. And I said, <laughs> who, who, who's dancing? You are. I thought, I was carrying the banner. You thought, wrong, you're dancing. And that was my introduction to to Gothland. Um, uh, we used to, if we were going up somewhere, we we seemingly always met at the uh, at Beck Hall at the Birch Hall Inn. That seemed to be our rallying point um, before we would move off and go somewhere uh, to to to, to, uh, to dance. Um, and at that time, of course, the dances were being taught in the village school. Uh, there was a thriving uh, junior, if you will. Uh, an intermediate team, and I mean thriving. Um, we had a, we we had a lot of kids who were dancing, um, and it was wonderful to see. In fact, I'm minded when uh, we went to the Liverpool, which was a garden festival, and I can remember going there. Um, and the, I don't know, they, they had a, an arena, and all the teams. It was an arena with. Uh, uh, with this green carpet that you marched on um, and it was set on stone, if you will, uh, which if you saw dancing, it didn't matter because it didn't matter whether you couldn't hear your feet or not. Uh, you didn't need to hear the tap unless, unlike if you were Northwest clogged or you were rapper dancing where you needed to know uh, whether you're in beat or not. And I can remember marching on and there was a men's, there was a banner uh, which Donk was carrying um, that's Steve Pearson. Uh, Donk was carrying, he'll figure largely later. Um, he was carrying the banner. Um, and then there was a men's team. Uh, oh, actually, there was a junior team. That's an under 11. An under 16 and a men's team went on to dance. And we were all from Gotham. The, the thing that stands out in my mind that day was we had the oldest bus you've ever seen from Lockton. I can't remember whose coach is it. Was it Lockers of Lockton? And we were set off and there was an inspection hatch. We were going out along the M62. And if the wind blew, this inspection hatch blew up and you could see the prop shaft and the, and the floor of the M62. Uh, we traveled in style, not, but it got us there and it, it, it got us back. So, so 1982 on over, um, the, team, the team was thriving. Um, we were out and about as, as, as needed. But I was always told, and it's one of the things, if you will, that helped the team uh, quite a lot, was uh, we plough our own furrow. Um, doing too much tends to burn some teams out. Some teams thrive in it. Gotham just does enough. It does enough and it does a little bit more and it can vary in and out. But we were, we were doing quite well. Um, one of the things, unfortunately, that happened from this period on over, from 82 on over, uh, they introduced the national curriculum. And the national curriculum had the effect of effectively stopping us going into Gotham School on a Wednesday afternoon to teach sword dancing. And they were also doing talk country dancing, because at that time in the, in the late in the 70s, well, up, up to midway through the 80s, um, or the early 90s, in fact, there used to be uh, the Whitby Competitive, um, where there was classes for sword dancing and Morris dancing and so on and so forth. And sadly, that's no more. That's that went that disappeared off the radar screen, which is really, 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 really quite sad um, because it taught a lot of people at what I consider to be the heritage of Britain. It isn't just sword dancing or Morris dancing or clog dancing. It's all the singing games and the games that kids played in the playgrounds and, and strip the willow and all the, all the other things that they did. They're very important, utterly important to our culture. <coughs> so we got a new headmistress and she decided that um, they didn't have time in the curriculum and that we could no longer uh, go into school, which could have had um, serious repercussions upon the team. The thing that sort of helped Gotham along to a bit, to a degree, was that, <coughs> excuse me, 
we had families where there was fathers and sons uh, and and grandsons who um, um, were part and parcel of the team. So he had like the late Michael Atkinson and his son David and their lad Daniel. So there was three generations of Atkinson. Um, and then there was the Ak there was the, new, the other Atkinson family where he had Les and then they had his lad Jack or little Jack as he want to be called. He's no longer little. He's about six foot three, I think. Uh, but I call him, he's all grown by the name of Little Jack. Um, you get these names, you keep these names. And so we were very fortunate in that we had, uh, those were the Wally boys, there was the Jackson lads. The dad dan danced, the two uh, Jackson lads were taught to dance. Um, and and it was, uh, it, and they helped, if you will, glue it all together and keep it going. Um, we, uh, we as an organisation, got it as a team organisation, got involved uh, amongst other things, because we happened to be here. Um, we had a very large uh, support base within the village, um, none more so than when we got in, or I got involved with the International Sword Dance Spectaculars, which took place, the first one was in 1996 in Scarborough. Um, and there was a small organising committee who uh, no one or two had tuned in today. There was... Uh, Jeff Lawson, Vince Rutland, uh, Stuart Hickson, and Vin Wynn, and me. Uh, and it, people don't understand, and I certainly didn't understand, that if it lost money, it was uh, down to us to throw it in the bucket. Vince said he knew, but he never told me. Uh, but there you go. Um, and then the success that they brought on. But without go from Plowstots, and without the village, and without the, the, the ladies and the families behind the team, those, those sword spectaculars would have struggled, definitely struggled. So having a, <clears throat> having a base of a village behind you, which is what the team's had over the years, and that's, that's probably one of the reasons it's helped us thrive, is that we've, we've always had a base, we're village-based, if you will, um, and that support has, has propped us up. And I didn't know, I was told by... Uh, by uh, one of the lads later on that, uh, when the 1996 uh, spectacular was going on, uh, my late friend who was chairman of the Plowstots, uh, Marky Wally, our dog, he called a meeting of the team. I didn't know. And he basically said, whatever happens, we support in Thompson um, and we'll give him everything we've got. And they did. And Gotham threw everything into it. Uh, and we've, we've hosted teams in Gotham. We've been very fortunate. We've been able to put people into hotels. I mean, uh, the late Malcolm Simpson, who had the inn on the moor, um, he would put the he put the team up from Comna at rates that people just couldn't even get near. Um, we've had Lang Wappa dance in the village, and we put an appeal out around the village, and they were all given hosted by families in the village. So you know, our help hasn't just been restricted to if you will, the team itself. But it's, a, it's been a wider base of support that's helped the team um, move along, um, if, if you will. Um, and that's, and, 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 and I think some of the things that, that, that Gotham has done over the years, um, as I said back in the earlier on, back in the 20s, the money that they collected in uh, on the Saturday when they went into Whitby was always uh, went to pay for medical care. Um, so we've always had, if you will, a charitable sense, for want of a better word, or a charitable arm. And over the years, we've done many, many things. Uh, we've had duck races where you launch a thousand plastic ducks on the river, much to the mirth and merriment of everybody. Um, um, and, uh, you know, we've we've held all sorts of different events to make money. Um, and, and I think it's worth noting that, you know, this... It still continues today. Um, one of our lads, uh, I sort of skipped around to sort of in August 2019, uh, one of our lads um, who's now acting secretary, he's joint secretary of the team, um, Chris, said, uh, I think what we'd like to do, Keith, is uh, we'd like to do a Gotham dance on the top of uh, the three, I do the 24 hour three peaks challenge. Um, will the team support us? Yeah, yeah, of course we will. Um, We'll pay for the minibus or whatever it is, na 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 na, and off they would go. Um, and I think I, I don't think they realised 
uh, and I certainly didn't realise um, that to run up the three tallest mountains in the United Kingdom, the Lord above knows what the people who were at the top of these mountains thought. Because apparently, when they went up Ben Nevis, on it was one of the clearest days they've ever seen. There was hundreds of people apparently at the top, <laughs> and in marked Goat and saying, "Excuse me," whipped out some tunic swords. I think it was Vincey on the end of his squeeze box, uh, rattled off a tune, and then disappeared down again. Um, that's Vince Rutland. Um, and they did that, and they managed it um, in 24 hours. They went up and down the three highest peaks. Steve Pearson was riding shotgun. Sue Rutland was feeding them all to make sure they could get up and down the, the mountains. Um, and in the process, I think it's, you know, it's worth mentioning that those people who went on that raised over £8,000 um, for children's uh, uh, and cancer charities, you know. And I... I and, and as a person now who's, if you will, elevated to the point of president of the team, which I am, um, it makes you extremely proud, to, uh, in, very proud and very fortunate to be part of an organisation that can go and do something like this. Um, so um, we've got now following on is tune number four. Yep. All right. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just do a quick recap. So, uh, Reg and I, my brother, we went to Whitby School. We used to play the mouth organs for Joe Brown's teams. And um, we learned Morris dance teams and sword dances. We weren't playing for the Gothland uh, team then, but we, we knew the tunes. We learned from our father, and um, who said he probably learned them from um, Bill Pennock and uh, this Frank Humphrey. And um, the interesting thing that Keith's talked about going to festivals. Um, at that time, Joe used to take teams from uh, Whitby to Darlington Festival and to Whitby Festival, and we would see teams like Loftus dancing and uh, Lawrence Jackson School from Gisborne dancing the Boozbeck dance. And um, uh, that was quite inspirational from us, from our point of view, because we could see some really smart dancing and some really smart uh, um, melodian players. And um, I also saw the Kingsman dance then as well in the... Uh, I guess around about 1970, really smart dance team. Anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. we kind of served our apprenticeship with Joe Brown. And then uh, uh, in the late 1970s, um, I got invited to play for the Plough Stops. The, the one that I can really remember was a Morris Ring do um, up at uh, Heading on the Wall in 1977. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, I, I got elevated from the... Uh, um, mouth organ to my dad's old melodeon, a single world melodeon, um, which my dad had had in the 1960s and um, went and played for them. Um, one thing I should have said when we were at school, uh, it's interesting to, to look back at what tunes have been played over the years. And um, it's the uh, early teams around about 1920, I think, from what I've read, used to dance to two tunes that we still use now which are Pop Goes the Weasel, and also, um, oh, what's the other one? Um, uh, Cock of the North. Um, and then, um, but by the time that we were playing, started to learn to play in, in the um, 1970s, 1960s, uh, they were playing the Keel Row uh, for the first dance, Cock of the North. Um, Pop Goes the Weasel, and a tune called The Wearing of the Green for the fourth dance, and then the fifth dance was um, uh, Yankee Doodle. Um, when we were at, um, at school and we saw these Cleveland dance, dance teams dancing, uh, Loftus and the like, they used to dance to Oyster Girl, and um, uh, my brother got bored with dancing um, to um, or playing The Wearing of the Green, so for a long time we've, we changed to doing the Oyster Girl for the fourth dance, but... Um, uh, I've started to play the wearing of the green again now because I'm just a bit concerned that that tradition would uh, would disappear. One other thing that we uh, is interesting thing when we went to Whitby, I should I should say that the musicians have always worn a, um, a, a mixed tunic, half blue, half pink, um, because the dancers were either all in blue or all in pink. But musicians have always worn, uh, and this this one that I've got here, this is the one that I was dancing with in the 70s and 80s. 
And um, unfortunately, it's shrunk a lot since then. <laughs> and, and, and you'll see the picture on the screen. That's one a more, a more recent model, which I got from the maternity range at Mother Care. Um, <laughs> it accommodates a more generous figure, shall we say. Um, but when we were at school, there was this guy who um, uh, also played for Joe Brown. Uh, um, he was an old guy called Bill Linton. And he said that... Um, the tunes used to be played one after the other without a break. And I'd never seen the dances done that way, and I don't know where he got it from. But the interesting thing was he played exactly the same tunes that we did. This would be in the early 70s. So we have tried, I've been playing recently with Martin Pearson, who lives around here, and he was on the first slide. And we have tried playing tunes all together. So I'm just gonna play the first three tunes, which are the key rule. Um, Pop Goes the Weasel and Cock of the North without a break, just out of interest. Yeah. And this is on the old melodium we used to play in the 70s and 80s that my dad had got in the 60s yeah, and 50s, one. I think. and fifth tune as well, um, which we've been doing with a local band around here called the Bay Horseman of the Apocalypse, just to get in a bit of a look for them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, within the last three or four years, or four or five years, I thought, well, we ought to really go back to the original tune for number four, because if we don't, it'll get lost in the mists of time. And uh, it's interesting when we were talking about this the other day that Sally had never, uh, I don't think it ever played the Wearing of the Green for the uh, fourth tune. And uh, the, the difficulty with the fourth dance is, it's, uh, it's a long dance, it's double overs and double unders. It's quite complicated, so they don't often do it. Um, but it's also, uh, it gets quite tedious and boring. But what I found inspirational, Oz, if you like, is uh, the tune is actually very similar to a tune that the uh, uh, Dubliners played as the Rising of the Sun, uh, sorry, the Rising of the Moon, which is, uh, has got a bit more rhythm to it. And so I've started to play wearing the green again and um, hopefully we'll keep that memory going. <laughs> I suspect that tune maybe became um, used as a dance tune, maybe in the 20s, because it was released by as a record by John McCormick, who was a tenor, the Wayne of the Green, and that's probably when it, when it got taken up. So my father moved to um, Manor Farm in the 20s, and he would be um, learning those tunes in the 20s and 30s from, from the locals. And then the fifth dance uh, we do to... Um, uh, Yankee Doodle, and then finally the um, uh, the uh, no, man's. no Man's Jig is, uh, has got a tune on its own, um, although we do tend to use the um, Lassa Dulla Gale, which comes from the Cleveland dances for the faster part of that. But I think that's all I've got to say really about the tunes. Um, oh, I should say, I still have my cap, and Keith will right. talk about the caps, but... Yeah. Um, they used to wear the caps in the 70s and 80s, and um, uh, then, unfortunately, they, they are no more. So, yeah. there we I'll, go. I'll... <laughs> Me? Thank you. Uh, okay, cheers, Sue. Thank you. 
I, I, Sally's just put up something, you know, the momentous occasions within our our organisation. Steve's just mentioned the fact that we don't wear caps anymore. Um, that was the reason. The reason was that um, the only sets I can remember back in the 80s were a big bag of old GPO caps. They were all size six and a quarter and none of them fit our heads. Um, so, and, and also every time you bent over, uh, they fell off your head. Um, but it is worth remember, looking at the photograph of 1922 one and a picture of 1933 they moved from these paper hats to peak hats uh, as a team we tried to move along with the times uh, we were a member of the Morris ring at one time um, and I think we were partly the reason that uh, lady musicians female musicians usually to any gender you want to call it uh, were suddenly uh, allowed into the Morris ring um, as I remarked to one of their officers if uh, a certain person came to play with us, everybody knows it's Eliza Carthy, and uh, she came to uh, fiddle with us around about 1989, long before fame and fortune ever dawned on her. Um, and as I remarked to this guy from the uh, Morris Ring, if Eliza Carthy came along to you and said, uh, would you turn it down? The answer is no, you wouldn't. It was actually a bit more Nordic, if you will, or Anglo-Saxon. Um, and so that was sort of moved along. And then, uh, we supported a, a guy who went to be Squire of the Ring and uh, it became obvious as, uh, like a punch on your face that we as a team, which had been a male bastion, even though my two daughters were taught both in dances way back in the 80s, um, we'd never opened it up to ladies um, or females, if you will. Um, and sometime around about it became obvious we, we started dancing young girls, girls from the village school to make up the junior team in about 2000 and 2007, eight. Um, and, and that, if you will, was the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, we started with a ladies team around about 2010. Uh, John Howard, secretary, tells me he had a conversation with Sue Rutland about ladies' sizes. I don't know what the hell he was talking about, but there we go. Uh, and then in 2011, we were unceremoniously they say we weren't, we say we were uh, kicked out of the Morris ring, which made us laugh, actually. Uh, it was quite funny because they asked us to, to join in the first place. We never, ever asked them anyway. Um, and it cost us lobster thermidor when we, when, they, when we went to join in the late 60s, early 70s. That's also written in the team history books, by the way. Um, so we left and I think we were, we were looked at quite askance by other two sword teams. Um, that Gotham's as, if you will, committed cardinal sin. Well, actually, those who uh, looked at us askance at that particular moment in time seem somehow to have followed us. And it's probably one of the smartest moves. When we, and I think we like to be smart. It was something that needed to be done. It has been done. And, of course, when we couldn't get in the Morris ring, that's when we decided Morris Federation was where we, we would pick up our bags and, and move. And, and, you know, we're quite happy doing what we're, we're doing. Um, the time that we, uh, so, you know, we've got ladies dancing with us. Um, hopefully we can grow that. Um, and then about mm, three years ago, we thought, well, um, what we would like to do, what we thought we would do is start looking at what we could do in and around schools. And by a circuitous way, <laughs> we were invited to go to Broughton uh, St. Peter's uh, to teach sword dancing to uh, to a school over there. And I think our claim to fame is we had something like 80 odd children all dancing uh, uh, a sword dance at their St. Peter's Day at the same time. Um, and from there, as a little band of us, we were doing quite well till COVID-19 dropped in. Um, we'd managed to get ourselves uh, into, we were out. Mm. We we're getting to the point where I think we were going out four days a week into schools um, in our area uh, with more on the list to teach sword dancing to. Um, fortunately, we, there, there was three of us with two musicians, myself uh, and Will Price, uh, it was Wendy Price's uh, grandson. Um, and, and, it, and it went really, really well. Um, COVID-19 dropped in. We, we managed to get a, the first junior tournament off the ground, sword dance tournament, last March, and then the week later, um, the end of the world as we all know it, uh, came. Um, 
hopefully when this is all over, um, we'll get back into the schools again because I think actually there's uh, something that needs to be to be done and to drive this forward. I don't know whether you want to run no man's stick, do you, Sally? As a team, we try to look forward. Um, you can probably see me sitting in a thing called the hut, as we call it, our Gotham Community Hub. And so we as an organisation um, have, uh, have put, have put our time and effort into it. Um, yeah, well, that's, that's, we, uh, we invested some serious money as a team. And we now have our own headquarters with, don't know whether you can see it, but don't know whether that shows up, but down at the bottom there, we have our own display cases. Um, and in it is all our artefacts. Um, we opened, we reinstituted the, the village library, which was something else that we wanted to do. I'm sort of sitting here. Um, and uh, down at the bottom there, all of the things that we had are now safely and securely uh, locked up. It's a place that sits in its own land. Um, and we hire this venue out. Um, there aren't many teams. Again, we're very fortunate. 
there aren't many teams who can actually say, well, they've got their own home where they can put their own things together. Um, the display cabinets are actually uh, hand-built oak display cabinets as well. But again, without the likes of uh, people who helped us, who were on the trustees, Vince Rutland, Jeff Lawson, Doc Rowe, he's another one, uh, Phil um, and uh, Aubrey, 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 Phil Eaton, Aubrey O'Brien, um, people like that became trustees of this venture that we set off. And from zero, and we literally had no money, we've managed to build our own base. So the future, where are we? Well, the future is on hold at the moment. The future of the children, that's for sure. I'll have a book out on the Plowstots and its history if anybody's interested. Um, I should add, by the way, that, that that picture in the middle, which is Gothen, which is uh, Sean the Sheep, uh, that's taken, we actually put Gothen on, but that's taken from an original painting by Peter Lord. And when we were building the hood or the hub, we sold that for three and a half thousand um, pounds. But we've got them on T-shirts and individual prints, if anybody's interested. And the left-hand side is the book that I've just had printed, which is all about the village. Next up will be the history of the Gotham team. And I'm now talking to Phil Eaton about doing something about the sword dances of North Yorkshire and uh, East Cleveland, pulling a lot of the information that's available together. I think it's important. Um, I'm spurred on by uh, John Widdison. Uh, write it down and then it's there for posterity. Uh, so if there's anybody out there dillying and dallying and wondering whether they should or they shouldn't, if you've got the time, uh, and it does take time, please do write it down because it's there for posterity. Without what was, without what Dowson had, did, and without other people, Trevor Stone, um, or Pat Sears, or Pat Redman as was, and others, um, I'd be a bit ghost, and we probably wouldn't be sitting here. Um, and uh, we've only skipped over part of it. Thanks for your time and your trouble. Done.